my name is Jewel. You don't need to know who I am, but you should know why I'm here. My grandpa, Stephen, is an author of a new exciting play called When the Break Happened in Orangeburg County. It's about our ancestors from when the break happened in 1865 until now. Many of my relatives are featured in the play from my great, great, great grandpa Stephen to my great grandpa Stephen to my grandpa Stephen. Guess what my uncle and cousin's name are? Stephen, go to www.thebreakinorangeburg.com to learn more. An online store has been created to honor those relatives and other families with products featuring the Break logo. Go to www.thebreakstore.com to purchase items today and help to produce this play. Please! Welcome to a new podcast show about stuff. It's the The Show About Stuff, The Stephen Davis Show. Here's your host, Stephen Davis. Hello to you, my friends. Welcome to The Show About Stuff, The Stephen Davis Show. Today's show features the great Florence Anthony, gossip columnist extraordinaire who writes for the Philadelphia Sun syndicated radio host, TV contributor, and author of a new book, which I'm going to let her introduce to you when she comes on. Thank you so much for being on my broadcast. I want to ask you, as I do every week, because this is a show about knowing about people. So I want to start off first with your childhood. Where were you born, about your parents and your brothers and sisters? I was born actually in the infirmary at Alcorn State College in Norman, Mississippi. My mother was there because my grandmother died in January in Yazoo City, Mississippi, and I was born in March. So she couldn't travel back to Michigan right away. But I grew up actually in Ann Arbor, Michigan, even though I did spend summers in Mississippi. My father played college football at Tougaloo College in Tougaloo, Mississippi but he graduated from the University of Michigan after he became an adult. My mom was a school teacher. In fact, my mother's entire side of the family are school teachers. My grandma Florence and my great aunt Winnie, they taught school in the the very early 1900s. In fact, there's a staff picture from 1928 of a high school and my grandma was on the staff and so was my oldest aunt, Eddie May, and her husband, my uncle John Allen. And then my uncle John Prentiss, he was a principal in Picayune, Mississippi. And then my aunt Stella taught English in Sherman, Texas, and my aunt Eddie May, she taught both, as I said, Alcorn State College, but then they moved to Clarksdale, Mississippi. She taught at Cahoma State College and gra- and retired from Utica College outside of Jackson. And my mother taught first grade in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And when my dad went back and got his degree, he taught special ed at uh, Forsyth Junior High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'm an only child. So that's the story. How was it growing up as an only child in Ann Arbor, Michigan? You know what? I didn't really notice a real difference in things because I have a lot of cousins. So I was always around my cousins and always around friends. I've always been like this friendly person wanting to get out and do things. And I was always involved in a lot of activities from a very small girl, be it the church or the Girl Scouts or the Ann Arbor Junior Theater or something or other. So I never felt the loneliness of anything of an only child. And where did you go to high school at? Ann Arbor Huron High. When I first started out, it was Ann Arbor High School, but the schools were already divided. For 10th grade, though, we were still in one building. And we were Pioneer High School in Huron High. Huron High was the new school. And then for the 11th grade, they split it up. Well, Huron High was there in the morning and Pioneer in the afternoon. We were the afternoon Pioneer in the morning. So it was split up. 
and we finally got into the new building of Ann Arbor here in high, my senior year of high school. Okay. You left high school and where did you go? I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Growing up, the two places that had the best looking women on campus to me, this is mine, was Howard and Hampton. So when you went to Howard University, how, how was it? Oh, it was the most magnificent four years of my life. I, I would do them over any day that I could do them. In fact, my uh, sorority line, uh, Delta Sigma Theta, my line, Untouchable 31, we had our 49th anniversary the other night and we did a Zoom. And it's like time never stopped. And we're all so still close. We have these uh, texting threads that we do on a like weekly and daily basis. We're in touch all the time with each other. It's just amazing the friendships and the foundations that I built at Howard University. I have so many that were Howard graduates. As a matter of fact, one of my former partners uh, in a business that we had together, Norma Lewis, who lives outside of London now, was a Howard graduate back in the 60s. That's what she got her <laughs> master's at. So I have numerous friends and did many things on the campus of Howard. And I loved Howard, at least visiting Howard. In those days, when you were going to school, there was so much turmoil that was going on outside across the country. How did you deal with it? Not so much turmoil in the 70s when I was in school. At, at college, you mean at Howard? Yes. Yeah, it, they had a, I think we got mad at something. They had a, a sit-in at the administration building. Mm -hmm. But for, for us, everything was pretty calm because the civil rights, it wasn't over, but we had certainly passed the, the gamut of the civil rights movement, which amazingly came back in 2020. <laughs> oh, we live in, in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s or something again. But in the 70s, things had calmed down. A lot had calmed down. Gone on, on every aspect. You've gone through the hippie stage, the this stage. All that stuff was more 60s. Martin Luther King's assassination, Kennedy's assassination, Malcolm mm -hmm. X's assassination. All of that was 60s. And prior to that, most things with the civil rights movement was 50s going into 60s. Of course, growing up both in Michigan and being in Mississippi in the summer, I always, you know, encountered the uh, for white only colored waiting room at the train station, the not the sitting at the counter. I did encounter all that as a very little kid mm -hmm. in Mississippi. So it was a big contrast a vast difference in being in Michigan during school year and then going down south to be with Aunt May May in Clarksdale, Mississippi in the summer. But we were fine because we were on the campus of Oklahoma Junior College and Aggie High School. And there were other teachers with kids. And so I played with all of those kids, even have kept in touch with many of them through all of these years. When you graduated, how many were in your class when you graduated? At Howard? I really don't even know. That's horrible. <laughs> but it was it's really terrible. I have no idea. I can't even tell you how many people in my high school class. When you graduated from Howard, did you go back to Ann Arbor? I wanted to live in New York City since a little kid. And so I graduated from Howard on Saturday and moved to New York City <laughs> on Monday. I'd been back and forth because they had all these recruiters at Howard looking for jobs. But I had lined up a job because I actually wanted to be an actress. I graduated from a school, College of Fine Arts. So I had hooked up a job. I always summers worked the parks department when I was in Ann Arbor. And then when I got to DC, I always summers worked retail. So I had lined up interviews with both. I got a job originally at the parks department, the castle that's in the middle of Central Park. I got a job there. Uh, that was my first job out of college. But in the fall, I started teaching. Since I came in the summer, I worked that for the summer. I went up and worked in Yonkers at an alternative school. But I still always was acting. I went for auditions and everything. I got a cartoon. Um, the voice of her name is uh, Susie Sunset, the Billy Joe Jive cartoon. And then I began to do extra work on soap operas. So I consistently did work. And then the one summer... The Warriors came out and I was also working part time for my manager, Toby Gibson. They needed a thousand extras for this one scene in the park. So Sylvia Faye Casting, had, they were going to pay these extras non-union at $35 a night because they had to have the scene. So my manager said, I really don't want to be bothered with that. You just take that over and we'll bring all these kids in and we'll get the $3 ahead of time. 
And that's what I did. And they did right after that, there was another film, Night of the Juggler. It was a really busy summer with all of that going on. First, The Warriors and The Night of the Juggler, uh, the summer okay. of 1977 here in New York City. There was the blackout in the summer of 77 here in New York City. I lived through that. How did you do? I did pretty well because I moved into a building that my mother's friend's daughter also lived in, and I'd become friends with them. And so we were we walked down the stairs. And then the next day, the lights still weren't on. And we said we would drive up to Harlem, even though they had rioted that night in Harlem. But we went up to this guy said, well, Sylvia's restaurant. I said, but are they open? He said, yeah, I heard they're open. So we drove up there and they were open. And I said, are you sure the food is okay? Because I had never been there. And, and Miss Sylvia said, yeah, I have refrigeration that really lasted. And that was the beginning of a very long friendship with me and, the, and her and the Woods family. I'm still friends with them now. Yeah, we did fine. We didn't do badly throughout it. I, I was in juniors. And the light started flickering and then it went out. The first thing that they did was ran to the door and locked it. So you would not get out without pay. And then I got into a taxi with lots of people that was trying to get home. And they had a, a, a wonderful furniture store down the block from where I lived at. The next morning, there was no furniture store there. Yeah, they really <laughs> tore the city up that night. How did it feel with you? being a college grad, a Black woman in the Big Apple on your first job? Oh, I was very excited. I loved it. I've never had a fear like I should have. And I really think I lived in New York City before because I still don't want to leave. Quarantine out in the Hamptons with them. My boyfriend lives in Wilmington, Delaware. But I still don't want to leave New York City. I just love it. No matter good or bad or how my life is going, I just truly love New York City. How did you make the transition from the job that you were doing to the career that you really wanted to go to? The job that I was doing, and even I was working and all as an actress, but this other job of being a journalist uh, adopted me. I always did want to have a column. In high school, I actually had a column. I was a youth reporter for the Ann Arbor News. They had a youth page that was every Sunday. And mm -hmm. I was the reporter from Ann Arbor here in high school. So I always could write. And as I said, this world of journalism just took me in. It was not where I ever meant to go or who saw myself going. The first article I did, there was a guy how I got involved in boxing through Harold Weston. And the New York Times wanted to do a story on him and they needed somebody to write it. And so I wrote that. So that was, you know, pretty big uh, right off. And then I started to do a column in the uh, Black American newspaper called Keep Punching. At that time, I was also doing publicity for uh, different boxers and some football players. I had that column in Keep Punching, and that's what led me to the New York Post, because the New York Post wanted to hire a Black woman in the sports department as the agate clerk. That was in 1984. So that's what led me to the New York Post. I remember when I first met you, I met you backstage area at Madison Square Garden at yeah. one of the fights. And yes. I come backstage because one of my friends at the time was Hedgeman Lewis, who uh -huh. was a boxer. So and we used to run around in L.A. quite a bit because that's where he lived at that time. Y you got into writing. And what are some of the newspapers or outlets that you have written for? As I said, I started out with the Black American. I had done that article in the New York Times. Then I did a couple of things early on for Write On Magazine with Cynthia Horner, but I worked at the New York Post for 10 years. And when I left there, I got a column in a new newspaper called Her New York. It was a very good concept of newspaper for women. Mm -hmm. So that what I did when I left the New York Post. And that didn't last long. The uh, Globe had been calling me even while I was at the Post to offer me a job. At that time, I had also branched into television. I was doing the Joan Rivers show and the gossip show on E! and Geraldo, just about every talk show there was. I branched into some of the TV career and had also started to do uh, radio on WBLS. So I was a jack of all journalism trades here. So that's where I went. From there to her, then I went to National Examiner. It has to be noted at the New York Post, I was the first Black woman in the sports department, the first Black person in the entertainment department, and of course, the first Black person on the renowned page six. It, it, it was a groundbreaking career 
that I had at the New York Post. And from there, I went to her in New York and I had my own column in it. And from there, I got a column in the National Examiner called Eye on the Stars. And I was the first Black woman to have a column in a tabloid. Of all the things that you've done, which do you enjoy doing the most? I love it all. I also owned my own magazine twice, Gladiator Sports Magazine and then Black Noir Magazine. And now I have Black Noir online. It's blacknoir.nyc. But I, I love everything about journalism. I, I love uh, newspapers. I love seeing the words. And then you put the pictures with them and, and it becomes something altogether different. I, I also like uh, the work. I represent my boyfriend, Michael Spinks now. So I really enjoy the travel with him and the appearances because it makes these legends just so happy to be around each other. And it makes the people so happy to be able to get autographs and things from them. I love every aspect of it. I even I write novels. I've just finished my fourth novel. And I really just even love that. <laughs> Enjoy my work. That's, that's why you can't leave New York, because New York is yeah. the center of the universe. How did you come to decide that you want to sort of be around the sports venue? I was a cheerleader in high school and college. As I said, my dad played football. You know, all his friends were uh, football players. And I just always loved sports. I just love sports. Even now, I could sit in here and watch a game or a boxing match or something or other. Last year, sports left us. And the first thing that came back was the football draft. And uh, Roger Goodell, who's the commissioner of the NFL, is a very dear friend of mine. I knew him when he was an intern at the Jets in the PR department. That's how long I've known him. And he's somebody that he really worked his way up through the NFL. So last year when they had the draft, everything had to be zoomed in. He was down to conducted it from his base. After two days, everyone was exhausted. And one of the sportscasters said, Roger, take a load off. We got it from here. But it was just so wonderful. Now you've got baseball going on. You still got hockey and basketball going on and boxing is back. So it's just wonderful. Sports also, it, it regulates everything that you do because you have to learn to be on time. You have to learn to play as a team. My dad called everybody rookies. Hey, I just, that's how I got into sports. Let's talk about some of the really wonderful people that you have worked with and met over the years, starting with your most interesting person. Oh, who I think is most interesting? Oh, all of them. I can't, I can't say a most interesting person because everybody would get mad at me. You should be working for the United Nations. <laughs> Let's just talk about some of the interesting people. The thing with me is that through the years, I also made very good friends where mm -hmm. with my interviews. I'm very close to Latoya Jackson. I was very close to Michael Jackson. I'm very close to Wynton Marsalis. One time I went to Patti LaBelle's house for her son's, Zuri's, one of his birthday parties. A friend, he had invited a friend of mine, Marvette. And so we got there late because we came from New York to Philadelphia. Patty sent out for more chicken for me and got some dumplings <laughs> from down in her, her wine cellar because she said, you will never come to my house and I not feed you. And you talk about it. It's pretty exciting. And for a kid like me, a kid bo born in uh, Mississippi, raised in Michigan, to be able to call Michael and Latoya Jackson your friend. Even my boyfriend did for, for 30 some years on and off to you know been in Michael Spinks. His life. Really, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Yes, that's why our public lives vicariously through us. <laughs> yeah. And you more so because you have such a wide range of of folks. How, how was it during that particular period of time when Michael was going through all of that? I don't know what to call it other than the situation, but how was it in terms What's, of your... And he hasn't been through any... His brother just died. It's bad, but he hasn't been through any situation that I know of. No, Jackson. Oh, Michael Jackson. Yes. Uh, it was difficult. I was the only person in America who took up for both him and O.J. Simpson. And because of that, I was blackballed. And that's why I don't have a television show now. I was actually, I was blackballed, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. I knew Michael Jackson. I knew that he was not molesting children and I could not see him go out that way. 
So I had to take up for him. It's just something I had to do within my heart. Mm -hmm. And so it was difficult. His death was extremely difficult. To this day, I I believe that he was killed. Oh, yeah, I've always believed that he was killed. And and it was because of all the... the No, it was because of a lot of different things, which I can't say because then I might get killed. And please don't say it. I've always believed that, yeah. I've always, uh, that's always been my theory on the situation. Now, some of the other folks, uh, you mentioned Patty LaBelle, but you sent me a whole host of photographs, which I will put on this broadcast. But before I go forward, I have a surprise for you. I wanted to have a surprise that I wanted to have it really done up, but here's your surprise. Oh, wow. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Conrad. But yesterday at the funeral, I posted your picture. Your brother, oh. we were very proud. Shannon said, and my brother, he officiated at the DMX funeral. <laughs> yeah, we're all proud of each other in this family. It's a mutual admiration society. Oh, are you all related? We're brothers. That's right. Oh, okay. Stephen, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Flo. No, I said we, our mother's, uh, my mother's deceased. But his mother and aunts were much younger than mama and them, because I think our great grandfather kind of had two sets of kids, where right. some of them, like Uncle Miller and, and them, were much younger than my grandfather, Prentice. And was your grandfather Fred? What was your grandfather? No, Fred was my great grandfather. Elmer oh, great- was my grandfather. Oh, okay, Elmer, yeah. 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 And, and we call you know. Fred Papa Fred. I never met him, but that's my grandfather's father. Right? See, Stephen, we come out of a context of Mississippi. You don't know anything about that. I, I would tell him. I know that, some about Mississippi now. <laughs> hey, hey. I would tell him that we come from a people of strength and greatness rooted in that Mississippi experience. God has been good to this family and just blessed us to grow in many ways. And I, I guess we were fortunate in some sense because we came from Mississippi through St. Louis and Chicago and then we dad mom and daddy went to michigan because okay. my family right. was in michigan but all right. of his friends of course were in chicago the next generation that were branches east so the yeah. southeast atlanta washington and new york city and then we still have cousins in st louis um, right absolutely for my audience i wanted them to know that this is uh reverend conrad tiller Conrad Bennett Tillard from New York City. He used to be, before he became a Christian minister, he was the head of Mach 7 in Harlem, New York, as Minister Conrad Mohammed. And we had the privilege of working together on many occasions. What happened, Flo, is that when you posted that yesterday on your Facebook, that gave me the idea because I <laughs> she's related to Conrad. And I grew up watching Flo as a a, a young adult and, and teenager. And we did not know we were cousins until we were both here in New York City and mutual friends. and Family reunion until. That's where mm-hmm. we made it. That's correct. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. I, I was talking on the last show that I had. I, I told a story about how Reggie Bowman, don't you? Yes, of course. Out of Brooklyn, East New York. For 25 years, We've known each other and we talked to each other. And it was just last year that we realized that we were cousins. Yes. The same Absolutely. thing happened with Brother Fatim. Wow. He's wow. Your He's my cousin. His wow. great grandfather and my grandfather were brothers. Wow. And That's... I've known him for 20 something years and did not even know. And all of a sudden, last year, he put on his Facebook his last name. And I says, Oh, my mother's maiden name was the same. So we got together and we talked about it. And Wow. And so I can understand that. I imagine Conrad, she is not too much older than you. I had to, I had to make sure I said the right thing. <laughs> My mother's generation and older than mine. Now, now, your mother is who? My mother is, is Jackie. And my mother is the youngest of, of five children. And her, who is her famous sister? Her famous sister? All of them. Karen is actually not a blood relative. She is, in the Black community, we have... Uh, sisters. We have sisters and aunts <laughs> and uncles that aren't necessarily blood. So, yeah, yeah okay. very tight friends. They're like sisters uh, and have been for over 40 years. Yeah. Did you all uh, get the rest of the family together after you found out that you were cousins? Oh, yeah. His mother had already told my friend John she was my cousin. And then we started seeing each other. But I always saw Conrad around. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
No, and the funny thing is, I am very good friends with Jamie Brown, and uh, Flo and Jamie are good friends. So good it's friends. a small world. It's a really small world. I certainly so much thank you so much for coming on, Conrad. I wanted to surprise her. I wanted to see that well, look on her face. I, yeah, I love. You know, to straighten out your. Toes. Oh yeah, yeah. For five hours, I tell you, I, it's a wonder uh, I still had starch in my shirt, but it was a great <laughs> celebration. I told him yesterday for an African king, sometimes they celebrate a funeral for 30 days. So he was worth it. And it was great that Pastor Bernard opened up his church and and it was just a wonderful. They actually were going to do it up in Westchester because he's from Yonkers and Mount Vernon. But there there was no church large enough during COVID that could accommodate. And so Bernard, although he has like a 5,000 capacity church, they they would permit 1,500 people. So it was a blessing, and I think he should definitely be recognized. Yes, and it was a beautiful service. It truly yes. was. I'm proud of you, and keep doing you. I'm so proud of you. Keep doing you, too. All right, Stephen. Hey, take it easy. All right. All right. Ah, I got you, didn't I? That was just wonderful. <laughs> now, I want to also have some words in terms of association with some of the people that you sent me photos of. Just a brief word on them. Muhammad Ali. Of course, he was the greatest. And I actually worked for him. I worked on the Muhammad Ali coin and the Muhammad Ali cologne. And that was something else I would never think in my wildest dreams would ever happen. So uh, <laughs> that's pretty terrific. Michael Spinks. About- he of my heart. So you're not, you're definitely not going to say anything bad about him, <laughs> Eddie Murphy. I love him too. I like everybody. Eddie Murphy to me is like the greatest talent out there, and he proved it when he did Dream Girls. It's ridiculous he didn't win the Oscar for that James Thunder early, but his timing, everything is just terrific. And plus, he's a good guy on mm-hmm. top of it all. Susan Taylor. She's the greatest, iconic. She's also my sorority sister. For our audience, Susan was the editor of Essence Magazine. Of Essence, yes, and now she has a, a mentoring program. A national mentor. Who cares, yes. Mary J. Blige. The greatest. I just love her. When I first met her, she had a little white short outfit at, at the Vibe party. And Andre Harrell, the may he rest in peace, had her by his hand. He said, Flo. She's going to be great. She's going to be a Grammy winner. And mm-hmm. look, she would even was uh, nominated for an Oscar for her role in that movie. <laughs> Any other folks that you are, are close to that you would like to mention? Oh, I mean, I'm close to a lot of them. But Wynton Marsalis, I said Patti LaBelle. I also was very close to Mary Wilson. Basketball players, Johnny Newman and Charles Oakley, they're very good friends of mine. So I became friends along the way with all of these people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also worked for Larry Holmes. I, I can relate to what you're saying because sometimes you do interviews and they're just interviews and you just walk away from them and you never see the person again. But sometimes you run into people that are just wonderful people and beyond the interview, you become very good friends. That's always so wonderful having. Now, I'm going to give you time to talk about your book. Oh, okay. It's actually my fourth novel. I have three others, Keeping Secrets, Telling Lies, Deadly Stuff Players, and One Last Deadly Play. And this new one is called Last Call for a Deadly Diva. And then I'm done with the Deadly series and these characters because these four books have a a core of... um, main characters in them but i got some real neat characters in this new one and we'll see it's gonna be a lot of tw- there are a lot of twists and turns they're actually murder mysteries black hollywood murder mysteries but one last call for a deadly diva does not take place in los angeles at all because of covid because it's coming out summer of 2021 i had to include the pandemic in it so because of covid valerie and her whole family they're in a the house she's a gossip columnist. she's based on me in Bridgehampton and her stepson Vance, who was a a top black jockey, but now he has a polo team. He's not far down the road. So it goes from the Hamptons into New York for one scene and then out to Las Vegas and it ends in Monaco for a polo match. And then Vance has an all black polo team where he's pulled together polo players from around the world that are black. 
some college because there's a lot of people don't realize these colleges with polo teams on them and they have black players on them. What gave you the inspiration to write these stories and to take the time to write? Because I know that I did a lot of research in my family and when it came time to write it down, the suggestion was to write a book on it. Taking the time to write a book, to sit down and to go through all that was not my cup of tea for so much. So that's why I wrote a play instead of a book. <laughs> I can get through it really quickly. His, uh, a guy, his name is Michael Wiener. He's since passed away. He was married to the actress Deborah Raffin. He had a book company called Dove Books out in Hollywood. And I would be on Geraldo with him. And he hated me because once again, I'm taking up for Michael Jackson. I'm taking up for OJ Simpson. He told me I was mentally ill on the show. In fact, one of my cousins called me up. They said, do you have this man's number because this is not right. We don't like this. We're going to call him up. So one day I answered my phone. They said, hi, this is Michael Wiener. I said, are you coming to New York to kill me? I said, no, <laughs> I actually really like your guts and, and that you're not afraid of anything, but it's show business. I'm like, okay. He said, I'm doing a, a series of murder mysteries and I want you to write the black one. And that's how Keeping Secrets, Telling Lies came about. Mm -hmm. And uh, he died in the uh, midst of all that, but that's how it came out. The next book, Deadly Stuff Players, I had started working on it. And uh, Suzanne DePass was producing Zane's Sex Chronicles. I went to the premiere and Suzanne DePass introduced me to Zane. And so I said to her, oh, I have a book that I'm working on. Perhaps you could put it out because Zane had the streetboard books. And she gave me her card. And so I sent her the chapters I had. And she called me up and she said, you need a synopsis. She said, I'm going to email you a synopsis that I wrote and just follow that with your uh, characters and everything. And so I did that. And then she called me back up and she said, OK, I'm buying your book. Just sending you the contract in advance. So that's how I got with her. But I don't want to talk against Simon & Schuster because technically, I guess I'm still a Simon & Schuster author. But I didn't like the way they did things because you have to offer them your next book. And I did offer it to her, but she said, at that time, I didn't know she was slowing down with her imprint. I guess that's really what happened. But she said uh, that she was going to pass. And I said, can I take it somewhere else? And she said, okay, fine. And so this guy, his name is Terrence Russ. I was on the phone talking to him. And he said he'd just gotten off the phone with Wahida Clark. And I said, oh, gosh, I'd like to meet her because I would love for her to do my next book because uh, she has Wahida Clark Publishing. And mm -hmm. so he put us together and she bought my next book, Sight Unseen. And the way that, that was One Last Deadly Play and the way that the Last Call for a Deadly Diva came about, they repackaged some books right before Christmas. They put mine in a package with like four other books. I sold books right away. So then they called me up and said, do you have another book? That's how this <laughs> new one came to be. Is it taking off yet? Or it hasn't, no, it hasn't come out what? yet. I've been waiting on the cover. It was originally supposed to come out. May 31st, but I was two months late because I moved in the interim and it wasn't, this book didn't flow. I, I don't know if it's because of the pandemic or what, it didn't just flow out of me like the others did. So it was a little more difficult. I would go to sleep and then I would think of stuff in my head and then I'd get up and write that down right away. So the next morning I can act upon it. I usually write books in three months and this one took about six. I'm a little late, but I'm hoping she could still get it out by July because it's a summer book. What are some of the things that you would advise young folks who are looking to be a writer or to be a newspaper columnist or to be a radio host or be a TV co contributor? What would you advise them to do? I've had one of those careers. Nobody gave me anything. Mm -hmm. I've truly worked for every single thing I've got. When I went for the interview at the New York Post uh, and gave them my resume, all that Jerry Lisker could see is that I had worked for Butch Lewis and Michael Spinks. That's all he kept saying. Oh, they're my best friends. They're my best friends. So I, as soon as I left there, I called Butch. Butch said, he's already called me. He's going to lay the gig on you. So thank God that I had relationships. And my friend Irene Gandy and I every day talk about how you have to have relationships. And that's how you get to the next level. Like I went to the Suzanne DePass's event. Zane was there and I met Zane there. You, that you have to have relationships and you could get ahead. You also have to get a college education. That's the first thing everybody's got to do. You have to get a college education because to get any decent, any type of job, 
they're going to look for that. High school ain't working no more. You've got to have a college education. I really don't know if I would uh, recommend print journalism because you really don't make any money. I remember <laughs> making $40 a, an article for Amsterdam News. <laughs> it never changed. Uh, some things never change. The Daily News, I'm a freelance uh, contracted writer for them. They were paying 200 a story. But when the new people came in, Trump, who I also signed a contract, they want to just pay $50 a story. So I mean, unless you like a Cindy Adams or something like that, it's not going to make a lot of money. The New York Times, they, I guess they probably pay best in the country. But the mm -hmm. average print of journalists in general media only makes 35, 40,000 a year. So it's not a great vocation. But I always think you need to have three incomes work three jobs uh, because that way if something happens to one you still have an income coming from another that's how i look at life it's juggling things you must have been from the in living color school <laughs> you gotta have more than one income if you don't you'll be in a rut well, i also used to have an office on a 22nd floor and in moved downstairs on the second floor, Butch Lewis, Harvey Alston. It's, it's amazing how you have tracks where you run across each other. You might not know each other very well, but you run across each other. And it's the same thing as when I was talking about earlier, knowing Brother Fatim, at, he was at KISS at the time, and then he moved over to now at BLS. But knowing him for so long and running across him and not even knowing that he was a relative. Yeah. In closing, I want to ask, what is your thoughts in terms of what's going to happen in the world of journalism going forward? I think right now, because it's just so much news every day, we have news we don't want every day even, that it's good, it's good, it's going to be a good field because there's just so much news and everything revolves around news now. Every single thing revolves around news. And so it's a good field to go into, but like I said, print newspapers are a little shaky. More of so look at magazines, maybe television, radio, because newspapers, they really just don't pay much money. You need do, about five jobs. Do you have a podcast or a YouTube video? No, I don't have a YouTube media. <laughs> Any of that technical stuff. Are you lucky I got Zoom? And I <laughs> fought it in the beginning. I said, oh, no, because we went for months with no hairdresser, no lashes, no nails. It was crazy. Uh, I'm not going on any Zoom. And then I finally had to get it for my sorority's anniversary. So uh, I think that you would do uh, a very well with a podcast you two combined because uh, you have much content in terms of your own life story, but in terms of what you do on an everyday basis. And at some point you could monetize it. It might take a while, but I think that uh, in, instead of where others are trying to get on and they're not known, you have a name. I'm pretty busy because I have the daily syndicated uh, radio feature Gossip on the Go with Flow. So I have to write and record it every day and get it out to the stations. I have the weekly column, Go with the Flow. I do some independent work with people. And then even now with Michael on uh, appearances, we've been doing private signings. He was even here over the weekend to do an appearance out on Long Island with a boxing program that they're bringing to help Parkinson's uh, disease patients. I, I don't need a YouTube thing. It's just one more thing. <laughs> and hopefully I'll be able to get back out there with my books, with book signings sooner. Or I would like to extend an invitation whenever you want to come on. And if you want to bring Michael <laughs> and you on together, I would love that. Of course, I would love that. It's things that you want to break. I'm here for you. <laughs> okay, then we'll come back when the book comes out and I have a date for or at least a cover. Yeah. Okay, that, that would be good. I do thank you so much for being on this work. Yeah, that was wonderful. I'm here to please. That's it for this week's episode of the show about stuff with Stephen Davis. Tune in next week for another wonderful episode. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning in this week. Hope you enjoyed this show about stuff. See you next time. Branded gifts for the holidays, birthdays or just because. Visit us at www.thebreakstore.com. Hit the right black get in touch button.